let's just talk. Um, try and get some exchange going between um, the two of you, and then let's um, open this up for um, for wider discussion. I was just uh, I'd be interested in both your reactions uh, to this. That I was very struck um, about how. Uh, th about your images of the gated community, the protection of private space, um, which inhibits people kind of living out. And I was thinking about it, you know, personally in the context of the constituency that I represented for 23 <coughs> years, where in the poorest parts of the constituency, what people long for is precisely that. Um, you know, when, uh, when uh, the debate is about what you spend on a housing estate, what people want are entry funds. They want secure gates. They want a way of, if you like, sort of locking themselves in instead of living out. And this, um, this sense of which I think is incredibly attractive, of living out that you describe, is something which, in my experience, and I'd be very interested to hear um, other views, is, uh, is something which is created by mixed communities, people from a range of social backgrounds, ethnic backgrounds, age and experience. And right. that really <coughs> is, the, is the absolute prerequisite, because it's that that creates um, a sense of safety. And safety is a sort of prerequisite to porosity and this sense of um, opening up um, that, you, uh, that you describe. And you know, I'm, I was interested in your, in, your, um, in your references to Daravi because I, I know, I've got to know, as you know, Daravi quite well through the work I do with um, a, a charity which works in the communities there. And there are contradictions, you know, the, the contradictions are family shacks in which 10 people live, which are spotless, beautifully ordered, but where the order within the shacks is constantly threatened by crime. Um, but there is plenty of living out because there isn't enough space um, for 10 members of a family to live in. So, I mean, there are all sorts of contradictions here. And one of the contradictions or, or, or the facts I think it's important um, to build is the universality of the, the appeal of this, which, uh, which builds on certain um, absolute prerequisites. One is safety. Um, the second is actually a respect for uh, property, what is mine um, and what is not shared. Um, and then I think the third is uh, the availability of space to live out. Now, and in, you know, the, but which takes me, I think, to the final point, which is, you know, where is the state in this? And you see, the only state intervention in Daravi is to, sp is to spray the rubbish in the summer to uh, keep the uh, Anopheles mosquito, which brings uh, malaria, at bay. But if you think of communities in our city, and I suspect in New York, what private places schools are when the kids aren't there, what private spaces, hosp PFI hospitals, have become where the community can't use them um, except by, uh, with the consent right. of those right. who own the school. So I think that, um, you know, I, I think that sort of empathetically, there's such enormous appeal and a sense of warmth in this. But underneath, there needs to be a discipline of organization which realigns the relationship between the informal community and, uh, if you like, the, uh, the, the property of the state. And it's the state that has to let go 
and trust the community. Yes, I, I that's very, uh, yes. I, I think the way I... Do you want uh, to think about that for a minute and maybe, <laughs> Suke Suketo, do you want to? <coughs> um, I've had this bug and mm, I know mm. how wretched you can no, feel. No, it's all right. I'm, absolutely uh, heroic. Uh, 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 double whiskey, we'll see you there. <laughs> no, I, I'll respond to you about this, and uh, uh, something you and I have talked about. And I'll respond to you in a very personal way about this. I grew up in a housing estate in America, uh, unbelievably grungy. I guess what they, you call in this country a sink estate. So, I mean, it was uh, it's called a place called Cabrini Green in Chicago in which people lived behind locked doors, two or three of them. There was nobody out in the lawns of the estate. Um, people were afraid to go up and down the elevators and exactly. so on. There were plenty of eyes on the street, you know, that Jane Jacobs thing, but there was nobody to see. Uh, the uh, and the city had abandoned us. It was really, a, um, I'm not very r romantic about poverty. We, we, were, uh, 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 we were something they wanted to disappear in, in time. After 40 years, they tore down, it was a huge project. At one point, people in the community, since cops wouldn't go in, ambulances wouldn't go in, hired uh, security guards to be out in these open spaces from five to seven every night. And people, because they are armed, it's America. They're, the security guards are armed. They're willing to shoot to kill. And, you know, it's not Britain. People felt safe to come out. Those two hours, which had formerly been sort of adolescent criminal uh, playtime, became the least dangerous hours. And people learned The something. least dangerous. The least yeah. dangerous, because there were people out and about. Yeah, exactly. And what disturbs me about, about housing for the poor I could have showed you uh, something that the World Bank did in Delhi, which was appalling, which is create housing for the poor, which replicates what went on in Cabrini Green. It shuts people up inside. It puts them, security is presented to them as a matter of a defeat of a boundary mm. rather than, than porosity. So, to, you know, I, I just say this personally. To me, this is an issue about people think, you know, if they've got five locks on their door, they're safe. But they're not. Uh, if there's nobody about and they get in the elevator, they're going to get mugged. Or walking on the street, going to a convenience store, they're going to get mugged because they're the only person on the street. But it's been sold to them that for the poor, that a gated community will actually make them safer. So this, to me, this whole issue of security is a kind of, it's false, and it's a kind of very bourgeois notion of, no, of what makes people secure. That if they can only lock their doors and nobody can come in, that they'll be safe. With that, I have to say. Mm. <laughs> so I've spent a lot of time in Dharavi uh, yeah. researching my book and then Going back since, since I've also spent a lot of time in um, the Brazilian favelas, particularly Rio, and I looked at the whole program of pacification. The difference between the Latin American and African cities and Indian cities is that we don't have drugs and guns. Uh, yeah, I mean, there is crime, and I've lavishly documented it in my book, uh, but it tends to be more organized. You're not going to get mugged in a Bombay slum. You won't, you know, get carjacked. Um, mm. So what happens in, in Dharavi is that <laughs> most people leave their doors unlocked mm. during the day and often at night too. So, so I remember going to a leather workshop in Dharavi and um, the man who had, uh, he lived in a two floor shack and uh, his workshop was on the ground floor. He had four 
um, stations where he hired people to make little leather uh, goods, you know, purses and bags and so forth. And he lived with his wife and two children above the workshop. So he works 16 hour days and he sees his kids uh, for 10 or 15 minutes in between breaks and sort of downtime, he plays with them. And now the government, as you know, wants to demolish Dharavi and there is this uh, scheme that they've come up with called the Slum Rehabilitation Authority, uh, mm -hmm. under which if 70% of the people in mm. an area designated a slum, and there's no heavier word in the English language than the word slum. Once you impose it on a group of people, mm. they're finished. Uh, so if the residents of, of what the government designates a slum, 70% agree, then a builder can come in and demolish the entire uh, neighborhood, community, and create um, luxury housing along with uh, replacement housing for the poor. Now I've looked at these replacement buildings and I know you have too, Richard. It's, and they repeat the worst mistakes of council housing elsewhere in the world. It's as if we are beginning from first principles. We've learned nothing of um, So he told me that the government's offered him a 270 square foot flat, which has its own indoor toilet, which it doesn't have right now. And it's brick and mortar. It's, an, uh, it's, it's not bad. Um, but they're not giving me a workshop in the same building. Yeah. So if I want to see my kids, I'll have to commute for an hour. Uh, and as I walked around Dharavi, I realized that, you know, they've b actually built a community there. And it's not easily transferable somewhere else into blocks of high rises. And that community protects them against crime. So they leave their doors open. Um, they know who their neighbors are. Um, and in uh, Bombay, this kind of anomie, um, alcoholism, drugs, this, it, you mostly see it in the transit or replacement housing for the slum dwellers who have been uh, evicted from these places. So this narrative of crime, I've been seeing it you know, in cities all over the world. In Lisbon, there's a place called Cabo dos Moros, which is a group of people from Cape Verde. And I went over there. It's, it's a piece of the city that the developers want because it's very central. So there's all these stories in the Lisbon papers about the crime in the barrio, uh, in the tabloids of, you know, the police coming in and drug dealing in the barrio. And in all of these places, I think the narrative of the crime is much more lurid than the crime. It's, it's more, more lurid. <laughs> it's exaggerated. <laughs> it's magnified. <laughs> then the, if you, if you <laughs> compare the statistics to the perception of crime, uh, and we see that in the US as well. I mean, as soon as the Black Lives Matter movement started going on, uh, the uh, police forces across the country um, started spreading uh, a kind of propaganda about shootings increasing, you know, the streets being um, given over to groups of rioting young black men. And if you actually look at the statistics, New York has never been safer. So that perception of crime, mm. I think, serves certain interests. And um, when we read these stories, we've got to be very careful about, you know, is it really the poor they want five extra locks on the door, or are they being convinced uh, to put five extra right. locks to guard against some sort of unseen enemy? Let's just think about how, th how this sort of transition from um, the, if you like, the kind of anxious community um, is achieved to, we, we achieve a transition to the kind of porous community. Because, I mean, I think, um, I think, you're, I think you're absolutely right, uh, Suketu. I think that um, there are many um, sort of geographic areas where um, the, the, the risk of crime is overstated. Um, but it's also overstated by the people who live there because they feel unsafe. Right. And uh, th th so there is this, uh, th there's, if you like, this cognitive dissonance. But the cognitive dissonance is very destructive of, you know, what uh, the kind of narrow place kind of um, experience, Richard. And 
I mean, the fact is that you know, all over this city, you know, in New York and so forth, there are communities that show this kind of resilience and ability to, um, I love the idea, you know, this uh, minimizing the importance of home because people live out more. And that is, um, you know, that is a very, uh, it, I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a rather wonderful um, ambition. But I think the, I mean, the point is, it doesn't happen by chance that yes. you, there's a True. contradiction. Um, there's a contradiction between the impulse that creates it and That's the pretty true. clear um, You know, I think one happens. way to think about this, and I should have said this before, but one way to think about this is that we put, I think, too much, uh, if we think that a porous city is gonna make everybody mutually tolerant, and they're going to be nice, you know, uh, yeah, exactly. pet each rubbish. other and yeah. for, it's rubbish. Yeah. But because it's, we need to learn from why it's rubbish, which is that there are dimensions of urban order which are purely, purely physical and which are nonverbal. And the kind of porosity that I think ensures a kind of urban order is a bodily comfort being with people in the midst of people who are different. It's something visceral. It's, you know, the ex hand extended to the stranger who's trying to get to work. A lot of, I, in my experience, I mean, one of the things that's terrible about academic urbanism is it translates the physical into the verbal all the time. And there are lots of translations yeah, that's, yes, that that's don't right. happen. Yeah, yeah. People have a physical experience of the city. They have nonverbal knowledge, yeah. uh, which they can't put into words. Uh, if you're comfortable being pressed up against somebody who is sweating profusely, and you're in a carriage together, very f familiar to any New Yorker in the subway, you're practicing uh, a kind of civic order. <coughs> but you couldn't put it into words. Mm. And I'd like to see urbanists concentrate more on what can't be re represented or symbolized in the way of saying these, you know, talking about diversity, talking about, um, ab about community. I think these are things that are made with our body, you know? That's and the whole really comes from uh, the agglomeration of fragments of behavior. I was observing exactly right. this this week, um, getting on to from the northern line, where you kind of bend over and you've got somebody's head in your armpit, to the Victoria line, where oh. queues form. And people, I mean, in this chaos, there is a kind of order um, about, you know, you, if you wear a backpack, which I do all the time, you take it off because then one more person uh, can get in and you, the, the, the way people fit themselves into each other, I mean, that's a pretty universal experience of living in London um, every day. But let's open this up a bit, and um, have we got microphones? Let's, um, uh, let, let's invite your, your questions or your, um, your challenges or controversy to um, Suketu or to Richard. Yes, gentleman in the middle who's holding his. That's you. Yeah. Hello. Um, thank you. Brilliant Speak talk. Speak up nice and loud so everyone can hear you. Wonderful talk this evening. Um, I feel very humble sitting here amongst the, uh, the company. Um, I have one question I'd like to put back to you, Sukutu, with regarding to your. Um, three rules. Don't exclude anybody from the conversation. Um, I say or ask that in relation to my own personal experience um, as a chairman for a residence association that is currently under proposal for a regeneration. Um, we just don't seem to be getting anywhere talking to our housing association and feeling that our views are being heard. Um, what could you propose in light of that? 
So the question is, I understand it is, you're chairman of a residence association, but you're being excluded from the conversation of the housing association. We're being condescended and patronised. <laughs> yeah. uh, uh, is, is the housing association wanting to do to you and your community things you don't want? Um, yes, yes. Well, I mean, for example, yeah, I mean, it's, 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 a, it's a hot potato at the moment, isn't it? Right. All over London, everybody's talking about regeneration. Yeah. Um, and uh, I'm mindful of the fact that our estate needs it. You know, I don't deny that. It's undeniable. Um, but I feel we're not part of the conversation. Our thoughts and views just aren't being um, actioned okay, upon. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, this is where you start reducing London's livability index <laughs> by democratic <laughs> protest. <laughs> I think if, if they're not you know, letting you into the conversation, you have to live there, and so you have to take control of the conversation. And uh, really, there re is no other way other than democratic protest. This is that if you look at community boards, my son in New York just became a member mm. of the community board of Park Slope and you know he could have these meetings and there, mm, there is a role for the gadfly. I'm all in favor of gadflies who so go up to these meetings and you know they claim and uh, at the very local level like the <coughs> housing associations um, this is where it's really inspirational to see democracy in action. So I'll give you an example. I've been following a group of, there's a South Asian um, housing rights organization in Queens. Um, and um, I once went with them to a building full of Bangladeshis in Woodside in Queens. And so it's a whole building full of recent immigrants. They're paying very high rents. The landlord is Greek, himself an immigrant. And I went to a um, residence, uh, a, a meeting that the um, housing advocates had called. And so all the Bangladeshis got down in the lobby. And there was the Greek man, uh, the landlord, in the back, you know, with his arms crossed, just watching the tenants as uh, they were trying to organize themselves. And this young woman gave this incredibly stirring speech about the nature of democracy in the US and how it really begins with this residence association. So these are people from Bangladesh who come from a, a, a place of great political volatility, but they also understand that democracy, civic action can get them things. And I went into their apartments and I saw the kind of accommodations that they had to make. So for example, there was an air conditioner that uh, had been left by the previous tenant, but the, uh, the landlord wouldn't remove it. The, it had been painted shut into the window. So the residents put a big gift wrap around the air conditioner. <laughs> so it stuck out, but it, was, it became you know, part of the ornamentation. So there were many of these compromises, but ultimately what they wanted was to um, you know, lower their rent, get services, um, and when this housing advocate went there and you know, explained to them, brought them into the conversation of civic <coughs> engagement, um, they mobilized and they took the landlord to court. Um, their rents got lowered. And in, you know, in this case, there really is no substitute for legal action, civic engagement. That's what I think the whole Black Lives Matter movement is about that. Uh, if you're not going to... Um, listen to us, then we'll make you listen to us. We'll stand out your window and shout as loudly as we can until you listen to us. Yeah, good, good. Okay, who'd, <laughs> there you are. So who'd like to um, follow that? Uh, yes. Can I see all the hands? Because um, we'll get as many as we can, okay. We'll uh, take your question, and then we're going to take all those contributions. Don't anybody else put up your hand, and then we'll be able to uh, get responses to all those before <laughs> before eight o'clock. Okay. Okay. Uh, so my question is to Richard. Um, Richard Senate. <laughs> <laughs> the he one is and not only. Richard. <laughs> yes, I know. Although I would like to be. Anyway, my I, I really 
think this concept of porosity is a fantastically useful concept. And I loved seeing these illustrations of borders and boundaries. But what I was trying to understand is, are these borders and boundaries physically constructed or are they also socially constructed? And they may not have any physical manifestation. Yeah. Well, I, I wouldn't put it as an either or. That in the case of the Van Eyck, that's an architect, a great, great architect, who has uh, a social vision that children should learn the city and thinks, what can I do in making these parks to make these kids learn the city? How can I make them street smart? And there are physical means he does it. I don't think he ever, he was a very dour uh, Dutch. I don't think he could play with the child to save his life. In that case, it's, I mean, he enabled something physically to happen. And indeed, he pushed it that way by not, you know, by leaving these edges unprotected. Um, I don't think he was, what I'm saying about this is, we often think that, you know, uh, communities or environments that are design-driven uh, are somehow against the way people live, you know, they're not expressing people's way of life and so on. And that design should follow dwelling. I, I think that's just too simple. With gated communities, for instance, you know, I, well, as a designer, I'd never do one of them. I think it's immoral to do that. It's something else, unethical to do it. But I think the object of design should be to take them down. Some ways you can do that are economic by making housing and covenants which exclude people racially or religiously illegal. That's a way to create a boundary condition. Uh, sometimes you can do it as has been done in, in uh, <coughs> some communities in Latin America uh, by getting this is the great lesson of Bogota by taking away highways and just physically letting the communities grow into each other. I mean, that's a physically driven design, but it has <coughs> a social point. So I don't see it as an either or. What it takes is an urbanist <coughs> who is not a servant of, of rich developers, but works with the people. But once you get to that condition, it's not an either or. Mm. Right, thank you, Richard. Let's, um, the, uh, what we're gonna do, uh, you get about 20 seconds each to make your point, to change the world. Um, so, uh, and we'll move around quickly with the, let's, let's start over here. Um, okay. Good evening, thank you very much for both of your talks. You'll need to speak up. Okay, hi, thank you. Uh, one of the things that I would like to ask you both, Suketu and Richard, perhaps to play off against each other, is Richard, I really in theoretically enjoyed your idea of living out as a way of developing a porous city. But the part of me that has been harassed and had friends harassed by the police for being out um, had a heart attack. But I did think, Suketu, of your first rule of of being able to be inclusive, which is to be inclusive amongst, uh, in the eyes of the law. And I wondered how you would both work together and to resolve those differences between living out and, and policing and the law. Okay. Uh, okay, let's go, let's go up to the, um, the right-hand side. Yeah, we need to worry about time. Okay, yeah, the, gen the, um, the, the gentleman who's got his hand up. Actually, there are quite a few of them come to Tess, Tess, we can't do this because we have to leave here yeah. at 8. At 8, okay. So, that's yeah. the Hello. final uh, th word. Th thank you very much for your insights. I, I would just love to go back to the point about <coughs> the narrative on 
crime and the narrative about porosity. <laughs> uh, <coughs> I'm a planning student uh, from UCL. I'm, I'm just wondering how can we unwind this kind of, uh, well, false narrative to make people, to convince people that mixity and porosity are actually good things for a city. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Now, we're, um, I've just been reminded that we, all, we actually have to be out by 8 o'clock, so I'm afraid we're going to take two more, and then we'll ask for final responses from Suketu and Richard. Um, the uh, woman right in the back row, and then have we got anybody in the middle block? Uh, yes, and uh, w woman here, just keep your hand up. Hi. Um, you spoke about the vibrancy. Yeah, speak up. Yeah, can you Sorry. speak up? Sorry, you spoke about the vibrancy of poor areas, but I was wondering whether you thought there was any way that the people who were putting out that cultural capital of vibrancy so the poorer people could benefit from that rather than just wealthy people who come in and have cheaper rents, and, but actually it costs the poorer people more and they don't really get a return? Yeah. Thanks. Okay. Thank you very much. Final contribution. Yeah, hi. Um, since this doesn't talk about inclusion, I, j I was just wondering what are your views on kind of the refugee crisis and how can we make sure that these people are included in cities? What's the kind of role of politics versus civil society? Okay. okay. Right. Uh, thank you all. Uh, Suketu, do you want okay. to... It's a broad spectrum of question, but I'll try yeah. to... Uh, um, Especially solving the refugee crisis. <laughs> yes, exactly. We'll do it tonight. Yeah. Uh, uh, you're absolutely right about the vibrancy of poor areas. In, so one of the ways in which slums are blighted is by saying that they're economically unproductive. But anyone who walked into Dharavi knows that it's a size of tremendous production. It, uh, it employs more people than the rich areas of the city. This is where, and, and there's all kinds <coughs> of little industries. Uh, and it's not just in places like Dharavi. In, you know, if you look at, the, uh, at music in um, areas of New York, where hip hops come from. I mean, hip hop is a cultural product which brings real economic value to the country. Um, the, the same sort of thing in uh, the Comunidades of Brazil. Um, there's tremendously vibrant culture which translates in terms of money. Um, you know, the thing about, you, you made this, I think, very valid point that being a woman in um, a Bombay train or a poorest community on a street, you know, this risk of getting harassed, you're actually very grateful for police protection against some of these people who are you know, out to attack you. So I think that uh, uh, <coughs> we, we need security, whether it's private or public, and we need laws. So I grew up in a building in Jackson Heights in New York, which was it's the most diverse neighborhood in the United States. And I grew up in a building full of Indians and Pakistanis, um, Haitians and Dominicans, uh, Jews and Muslims. The building was owned by a Turkish man, and the super was Greek. So all of these communities, these were people who were killing each other just before they got on the plane. So what happens when they come to New York? It's not that we start loving each other. We say horribly racist things about everyone else in our own homes. But there was a central courtyard where all the kids played mm -hmm. together. So c there were a couple of factors at work. One was that um, we understood we were all there to make a better life for our kids. We didn't. Um, uh, but we were also sending money back to hate groups in our countries. Um, but we couldn't act out on that hate in America because we realized here the law wouldn't let us act on that hate. So this is the benefit of things like hate crime laws. Mm -hmm. I mean, there is a role for a certain mm. amount of state supervision. Mm. Um, what else? Refugees. I mean, as I said, I think it's going to be the defining issue of the 21st century, this kind of mass migration. Okay, I agree. And, um, and also because the other defining issue is the great surge of wealth upwards, the fact that there's eight, the 80 richest people on the planet today own more than 
the bottom half of the world combined, mm -hmm. and it's only getting worse, um, that there's going to be a channeling of the outrage onto the refugees as we see massive uh, numbers of people on the move. So we're going to have to find some way of accommodation, and, and I think that I, uh, Tessa has read another piece that I've been writing where, where I talk about interlocals, that is people who are not nationalistic, but they have an allegiance to neighborhoods, to, to the neighborhood that they came from and the neighborhood that they're living. And, and it's a beautiful way of belonging where you don't have to be necessarily British or even a Londoner. You could have an allegiance to Islington or Brixton and also to Andheri in Bombay. And, uh, and you move between these and your allegiance is to the local. So I think it's those local allegiances yeah. that might be the answer. Richard? Well, I, about this refugee thing, you bring up something that's very personally um, painful for, for me because I worked uh, in the UN uh, in the 90s uh, about resettlement of refugees in Lebanon, which had a 14-year civil war. The, 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 the rates of displacement were like those in Syria today, which, by the way, I'd be amazed if it's less than a 14-year war. But what I learned about that, we made refugee camps because you know there were hundreds of thousands of people who were displaced, and we shouldn't have. Uh, we should have straight away gone into ways of filtering people into local shelters uh, using found spaces. We should not have these, uh, the standard way of making a refugee camp is to use a military model. Uh, they're all orthogonal. They're very efficient uh, uh, pr provision of services. And they usually make the experience of being a refugee worse because you're completely isolated. And the big challenge now, not in this country, because you're very ungenerous about refugees, horribly, uh, but in Germany, not something to clap about, you be deeply ashamed of, but in Germany, which has been generous, the problem with dealing with those 680,000, that's our latest count, of refugees, is how to get them out of refugee camps. And the Germans are, I must say, are, I, uh, it's really inspiring to me that they've understood that the whole problem is how to not incarcerate a refugee in the mentality of being other. And, um, s but I don't think as a whole Europe is, is going to, uh, uh, to manage it that way. The idea of porosity I have, I guess, is also built on that. That when you suffer a terrible wound like displacement, the thing you want to do is not be embraced, oh, poor suffering you, but to be absorbed yeah. into another culture where you can get on. You know, most refugees are incredibly hardy. These people who went across the, the sea into Greece, these aren't shrinking violets, you know? They're hardy. But for them, the politics of, of dealing with their situation is to get into an environment which is porous, rather than, than isolates them okay. as yeah. suffering other people. So thank you very much for your question. Uh, we made it. Okay. Uh, uh, So we finish on perhaps the biggest challenge to uh, porosity. And uh, can I just say thank you so much, Richard and Suketu. I mean, I think you've given us the most stimulating, uh, optimistic, but also challenging um, presentation. And I think everybody's going to take that away with them and keep on thinking about it. This session is going to have a long afterlife. 
So can I thank all of you for your yeah, questions, thank you. for coming, and uh, there we are. Thank you, Urban A.